Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Rod. Um, so today's topic, um, I'm keeping it deliberately broad because physical activity is probably at the core of a lot of our um, specialist areas. Um, and I guess this reflects probably some of, um, some of the mistakes, the many, many mistakes I've made myself in the past. I have no particular conflict of interest to disclose about this particular presentation. And these are the primary learning objectives. Um, I want us to think about how much time we spend telling people to do more activity as opposed to all the ways we tell them to be careful or stop doing activity, especially considering we, we would consider ourselves promoters of activity and exercise. I want us to reconceptualize or think about what we consider as safe exercises or activities and dangerous exercises. And then I want us to think about when we prescribe exercise or activity to a person, what drives that prescription? Is it based on systematic reviews and trials? Is it based on the fact that I like swimming, so make them all swim? Um, is it about what the patient wants to do themselves? Um, in terms of the presentation, lots of people have contributed in the in the form of this presentation, but I'd particularly like to acknowledge Tamer and Diane who work with me in the Spine Center. So when I think about my um, advice to people on being active, a lot of the time it's easy to sit on the fence, kind of saying, well, do it maybe, definitely do this, but maybe don't do it that way. And it reminds me of conversations I have sometimes with my wife when I suggest, you know, can I play golf Thursday evening? And she'll say, oh, absolutely, of course you can, darling. Just as long as we'll say, you know, you come home and put the kids to bed first, but absolutely you can play golf. And that kind of means it's, well, it's a, yeah, but I know where, you know, the terms and conditions apply sometimes, and that's fair enough. But again, I think when I think about what I've done with patients in terms of their activity, there's a lot of terms and conditions that have been applied, sometimes unnecessarily. And there's a podcast by Alarma Mosley on BGSM, and the basic premise of it is where the patient wants to know, am I safe to move? A very basic question. And I think a lot of the people who we see here will have that question, am I safe to move? And then there might be some follow-up questions. So I'm going to talk today about activity recommendations at a societal level, big picture stuff, but then more specifically looking within the clinic. So if we look at it at a societal level, we're often telling people, uh, kids, you know, get active, lose weight, and so on. Very laudable goals. Yeah. However, I think it's arguable that a lot of the time we'll, we, we put barriers in their way. We work to make this hard for them. For example, how much space and facilities and time do we dedicate to physical activity in the school curriculum? Do we um, build enough bike lanes and, and make it safe for people to cycle to school? And do we worry uh, about very basic, common forms of physical activity? So if you're a child going to school, one of the easiest ways to um, expend some energy is to carry your school bag. And yet a lot of kind of advice people get, especially from people like physiotherapists, has been full of fear about the dangers of carrying school bags. And yet when we look at these kind of things, we know that the good, decent, systematic reviews show things like school bags are not the reason that people end up with long-term back pain. So if you're an adolescent in Qatar or in Ireland or anywhere, how are we how much time are we spending uh, scolding you for not being active and not being lean enough and yet worrying about very basic, simple forms of physical activity? And then when we read the media, a lot of, you know, much and all we'd like to pretend that our patients' beliefs come from us in our 15, 20-minute consultation because, you know, it's that magical the moment. A lot of the time people will get their beliefs and opinions based on the media. So when you look at the media, what does it say about um, what you should do? The good thing is, some people, some articles will tell you the things that you um, exercise you should do. So this is good, right? But it does come with the caveat that these are the kind of things you should do to avoid injuries after 40. Now, unfortunately, I've started to pay more attention to these kind of headlines in the last year or two. And some of them are positive because this is saying, you know, these are things that are good to do, five you can do. Unfortunately, there's six I should avoid as well because they're dangerous. But apparently it gets worse. Sometimes, in a couple of years' time, I'm going to have to avoid 14 dangerous exercises. <laughs> now, I wonder how dangerous they are. Let's look at some of them. Push-ups, pull-ups, running on the stairs, um, dangerous, you know, things. You really want to be taking your life into your own hands practicing some of these things. And then there are other things where we, we can acknowledge that some exercises make people sore. So a lot of people will report back pain when they do sit-ups. You know, that's probably true. However, rather than saying, you know, if they're sore, here are some other exercises you can do, it's often tied up in the idea that these, this particular exercise, this deadlift or these crunches are bad for your back. At least though here they're giving them some alternatives. 
I really like walking. I think it's a great thing uh, as a kind of an accessible and cheap way to get people active. It's wonderful. But even when we talk about things like brisk walking, it always comes with the message that other types of exercise might be dangerous. So walking is low impact. Yeah, that's not a bad thing, but does that mean high impact exercise is bad? So running up and down the stairs, doing squats, that might have a bit more impact. That doesn't mean it's dangerous. And some of the recommendations, like how am I meant to avoid ever twisting my knee? It probably sounds like a good thing that I, you know, I wouldn't go out to choose to twist my knee, but is that a really a useful thing to tell somebody? So in terms of the, if we think of the patients we see or our family members, when they get physical activity advice, a lot of it is mixed. We're telling people be active, but then a lot of the time there's a lot of terms and conditions applied. Now what about in the clinic? I'm going to briefly mention a case now and we'll come back to it later on. So around this time of year, this would be a typical case we'll see in the spine center. A 19-year-old footballer, um, first episode of low back pain um, in the last while, in his third week of pre-season training or return to training. It's localized back pain, nothing referred, and there are a few particular things that make it sore, like <coughs> running and bending backwards and certain types of gym exercises. But again, some good stuff, he doesn't have any resting pain, um, and once he relaxes, he has, he has no problem finding positions of ease. He has got some bone marrow edema in the lower part of his back. Um, I want you to think about what type of advice around activity he would possibly get currently, and how you would phrase that. First, a question. Um, what activities would you say are totally dangerous that nobody should ever do? They're that dangerous. Russian roulette. That's pretty dangerous. <laughs> I would agree. Any others? And then would you feel that we'd need to uh, recommend somebody? I know you're probably thinking of Russian roulette, but just don't. <laughs> what activities are totally safe that you can say and guarantee a patient you will never get sore during this exercise? So we're left with a lot of exercises that aren't, they're neither very, very safe, you'll never get hurt, or they're the worst thing in the world. However, there are some common themes. If we went out onto the streets of Doha or Limerick, what kind of activities do patients often say, or athletes often say, mm, I did this activity, this exercise, and that was a mistake because that's a dangerous exercise? Bike? Yeah, and some people will say that for sure. But yet, I bet you there's other people say, well, the bike is wonderful because it's not like that other naughty exercise that's dangerous. What, what else? <coughs> Lifting weights. That's the devil's work in, in some ways. <laughs> what about running, and particularly running in a certain, on a certain surface? Running is like madness in many people's eyes. And if you should ever be on a hard surface, you know, you're, you're just looking for trouble. And there are other certain things. Where do they get those ideas? From people like me. This is my kind of coming clean moment. But from people like me and from the media and the magazines and our families and, and lots of well-intended people around us. I want us to think about are they scientific beliefs? Um, and I'm going to use back pain as one example. So if we look at things like we just mentioned, lifting, bending, twisting, what does the evidence tell us about back pain? Well, lots of systematic reviews. This is a summary of a series of systematic reviews. And in the small text it says, there is a strong evidence against a causal relationship between low back pain and, you know, moving and handling patients, awkward postures, carrying, sitting, standing, walking. So I'm not saying we're not sure, saying it doesn't cause disabling back pain. Then the stuff around lifting and twisting, they say there's an association, but again, not causative. Now, if we were going to go out and do a survey of people out in the street, I don't think a lot of them would expect that. So are there some parallels for us? I think there are parallels with this stuff around moving and bending and twisting and the idea of lifting weights. And if we look at the beliefs around running and knee osteoarthritis, I know there was a paper published last week looking at public beliefs around running. And again, it's unfortunately it reinforced the idea that lots of people f fear normal activities as being dangerous, especially if they develop pain. So there's two levels to this. Is this activity safe or dangerous? And then when I get pain, does it become more dangerous? I guess what we've got to try and get a, do a better job of getting across to patients is that getting sore in a part of your body when you load it is not abnormal. In fact, if Rod was getting somebody to do some Nordic exercises, it would probably be considered beneficial to have some soreness for a little period afterwards. 
and yet that's probably something that we haven't got that message across. So when people start some pre-season training or start their New Year's resolutions, getting a little response from tissues being loaded in the short term, if it's at a low level, is normal. The other thing that I probably mixed up a lot myself in the past is that something can trigger an episode without meaning you'll get long-term disability because of that activity. So how many people here, if you're comfortable disclose, have ever sprained their ankle? Quite a few of you. And what are the chances that you were weight-bearing at the time? Yeah. So weight-bearing causes ankle sprains, which means weight-bearing causes long-term disability. <laughs> Not really. So weight-bearing and running and, and maybe jumping off step, that can cause an acute ankle sprain. But when we think of long-term disability, it's not because of ju it's not that simple that relationship. So for sure, um, how many people here have had a bit of back pain at some point in their life? Yeah, and a good few of I'd imagine would have had that triggered by a bending movement or a twisting movement or something like that, lifting something. But again, the evidence so the evidence is not questioning that in terms of triggering an episode. What the evidence is saying, however, is that the people who lift most do not get long-term back pain. Now. That was the kind of the activities that cause back pain for a population as a whole. What about activities in excess that help low back pain? So I had um, a media interview yesterday with a radio station in Ireland, and one of the questions asked, which is very common, is what's the best exercise for back pain? And of what we can say from the trials is that all exercise and activities help, help back pain a little bit. And it, the good news is this comes across in every guideline, so it's a pretty consistent message. And in terms of preventative uh, interventions, it's the only one that has any evidence. Any trial that shows a difference between, say, exercise A and B, so walking versus swimming, swimming versus weights, weights versus Pilates, if they're an exercise intervention, the only time there's differences in effect is if um, it's around dosage and supervision. So if you do more of it and it's more supervised, better supervised, and related to that, you comply. Now I'm going to put in a couple of caveats first. So, because there are some exceptions, if we look at stuff like, again, like Rod and some of the guys here have looked at, if you look at hamstring injury or acute muscle injury, the type of exercise does seem to matter. So for example, if you're going to do some strength training versus some balance work, there's no argument that the strength training will be more effective. Okay? But that's a very different problem. Um, it's very rare to get somebody with a grade 2 hamstring injury that comes on insidiously without them realizing. Okay? And the aggravating and easing factors in the diagnostic criteria are all very simple and straightforward. And rarely do, I can think of a situation where somebody will have imaging findings of um, a major hamstring tear without noticing it at some point in the past. Okay? Hamstring injury and acute muscle injury is a tissue injury problem where load tolerance and load capacity are key. However, when it comes to persistent pain, back pain is what I'm talking about, but even tendinopathies, it's increasingly clear that when you look at the effectiveness of different types of exercise, they all help a bit, but there's not one magic one, eccentric, isometric, or whatever else. I discussed this recently with some people and they pointed out some trials that they felt um, proved me wrong. No, obviously I got very defensive and kind of had to start shouting, so I'll try and keep calm. But uh, if we look at some of the exceptions they raised, this is one very large trial conducted in Australia in, by Latrobe. And the conclusion was that this trial showed that um, physio individualized to the type of back pain, where if you had this type of back pain, you got these exercises, and this type of back pain, you got other types of exercises. It was more effective than guideline recommended advice, and that advice was like generally be active. So the argument is this is one trial showing a specific type of exercise is better than general activity. Read the next line. Is there any other reason it might be better? Because all I'm seeing is dosage and supervision. Another trial, again looking at whiplash, a very long-standing problem. People divide into three groups. You've got neck exercise, neck specific exercise, neck exercise plus a behavioral psychological component, or general physical activity. And the results here again show treating the neck, giving specific neck exercise, was much better than physical activity, just telling to people to be active. But again, are we comparing apples and, and oranges? This is the detail of the neck specific exercise. Supervised twice a week, practice at home, then progressed to a gym program, then they got a written individualized exercise program, comp including the neck exercises and general activity. This is the physical activity of this. A single follow up visit. Okay? Other than those, I cannot think of a single trial showing one type of exercise is magically better than another. Now, what do patients get told? So if we looked at 
Most activities are broadly safe for the body. Of course they can make you sore, but they're broadly safe. And most exercises over time are beneficial to the body in terms of pain, but also in terms of all the systemic health benefits. Does that match what patients are told? And a range of different researchers have told us not. So this is Ben Darlow's group in New Zealand. And basically there are two key messages they, they find. Patients are, are educated, if I use that term, about the fragility of the back and how easy it is to injure and damage this delicate part of the body, this structurally delicate part of the body, and how some movements are particularly dangerous. One of my own PhD students in Limerick, John Hurley, he's completed a systematic review looking at patients who have had back pain and gone through rehab with people like me, physical rehabilitation. And there's good and bad. The good stuff is that patients are really being told don't rest totally. That message has got out over the last few decades and broadly they consider exercise is good. But some movements remain dangerous. So you've got to avoid those ones if at all possible. So there's no sense that you know, their back can be trusted to do these other tasks. They should, they should uh, sorry, they're told they should not necessarily move normally or naturally and given advice to move more carefully and cautiously. And um, exercises that haven't been practiced in rehab, they're told you've got to be very careful if you're ever going to do those activities. Which makes me think if they're ever, why didn't they practice them? If there's a chance they're going to do them, why not practice those? And these are the things that patients were saying at the bottom. I might have to do it differently, take more time over things, I shouldn't bend, stretch or lift, and I had to give up certain social activities like dancing and so on. <clears throat> Actually, if my wife asks, tell her dancing is bad for your back, then I might be, I might be all right. So, where do we go from here? Maybe, maybe the clinicians, including myself, who were telling patients this, maybe we're right. Maybe patients should be more careful. Maybe there's a lot of patients out there recklessly and carelessly injuring their bodies by not thinking about their problem long enough or hard enough. So what did the system active use tell us? So Guy Sardell showed strong and consistent group differences in flexion relaxation. So flexion relaxation, um, space is a bit tight, but if everybody stands up for a second, just to wake us up on a Tuesday morning. I'll, I'll exempt you, Jan, if you want. <laughs> so flexion relaxation is that idea that when I bend forward, I can fully relax. So I'll step away from the microphone for a moment. But essentially, what I'm, it's the idea that when I bend forward, my back and my tummy can fully relax. So everybody should be. Don't force yourself and don't headbutt the chair in front of yourself. But see, can you get that sense that when you bend forward, initially your back doesn't really relax. It only relaxes. And when you, have back, when you have no back pain, it's a very easy and natural thing to do. You don't have to think about it. If you think, so take a seat. Hard to move there. Sorry. But if you think of children or pain-free, children or pain-free people moving, relaxing while moving is very, very easy. One of the, there's lots of variation in, in, in the human body and in kind of tests we can do on the spine. An absence of flexion relaxation is about as consistent a finding as we see. We almost never see it in pain-free people. Secondly, um, Rob Laird and Peter Kent, they've um, shown in their, in their review that people with back pain move more slowly compared to people without low back pain. So again, you could argue maybe that's the right idea, but it doesn't reinforce the idea that they're not being careful enough already. And of course, these factors around guarding and um, moving slowly are strongly connected to fear and protection and so on. Now, I used to think that, well, that's okay for persistent pain. When it's been there for three months, maybe they should get over it and kind of you know, stress their body a bit, but in the early stages, surely in the first week or two, or three, however we define acute, they should be very, very careful. And of course, I'm not in any way suggesting we should force the body through pain. What I'm suggesting is should we explore how much movement they can do? Because even in subacute pain, fear avoidance beliefs are prognostic. In other words, those who are most fearful in the subacute phase are more likely to not recover. And then, this sounds kind of mean, but there is a reasonable argument made that Allowing people to be very safe hampers their recovery. So the psychologists have done lots of um, work on safety behaviors. So when you talk about people with back pain, a safety behavior would be allowing somebody with back pain to kind of prop their hands on their leg or grimace or be very, very careful about how they move. And what we know is that oh, we learn a lot of, of, of um, new things to exposure, to practicing it and exposing it. And if you expose people while, while letting them keep going with the safety behaviors, they don't learn as quickly and they don't recover as quickly. So that can sound quite confrontational. And of course, you have to handle that situation sensitively and carefully. But allowing people to keep practice of safety behaviors, if you're happy that the body can tolerate the load, mightn't be a good idea. And while I'm talking, I guess, specifically around back pain, uh, Sean McAuliffe, uh, we all know, has done a lot of work on the Achilles tendon, showing 
these um, fear can be a, a common um, factor. Now, what about from a sports and exercise science point of view? What do we know about the safety of activity? Um, because the body's not that fragile, not even the spine, and in fact when we look at some of the work by people like Tim Gabbard, it appears that it mightn't be necessarily specific activities, but the parameters of activity that are dangerous. So for example, running fast is not necessarily dangerous, but if you haven't run fast for a long time, then sprinting for a, in a very, very hard session, that carries some risk. And so looking at um, not just kind of like the activity like bending or lifting or twisting, but how much and at what weight or what speed, that seems to be far more useful. And that requires a little bit more delving into their history. Because again, not being used to, the, uh, used to the activity is the risk, rather than in the activity itself. And this is why I think we see a spike in a lot of injuries around pre-season and in New Year's resolutions and you know every time we're going to turn our life around with the latest self-help book. It's good for business. Um, so again, looking at my own practice, and I'm putting in brackets my question mark previous practice because I hope, I wouldn't guarantee, but I hope a lot of this is in the past. But uh, a lot of it reflects uh, a famous Irish comedy called Father Ted. Anybody familiar with Father Ted? So it's a um, famous comedy off the west of Ireland. And in that comedy, there's one episode where the two local Catholic priests are told that they must protest against a film being displayed in the cinema, where the film is, has some scenes of an adult nature. So they have to ha have a protest with signs saying, careful now and down with this sort of thing. But of course, the only effect of that protest is that people pay more attention. The more you kind of warn people about the dangers sometimes, it's a bit like, you know, don't think about elephants. It's very hard to not think about <laughs> So in my practice, I would spend an awful lot of time to people. I thought I was kind of encouraging them. I would write down in my notes advice and education to be active. But then I'm pretty sure if I audio recorded it, it would have been primarily scare stories about the dangers of insert the activity you want, bending, lifting, twisting, weights, whatever. So I spend too much time telling people what to avoid rather than what to do. If I told them to be active, good, I'd be very proud of myself, but there were so many terms and conditions applied. So swim, but don't do the breaststroke. Run, but only run on the surface, and so on. Which, again, might be useful sometimes, but for how long? In, critically, I didn't emphasize the timelines for reduced activities. So if I said to somebody, look, we're going to back off your running because your back is a bit sore and that's making, it, that's making it painful, I didn't say, but we're only doing it for this week in the short term because there's nothing dangerous about running. You're just a bit sensitive to it. You seem to have overdone it, and we're going to do these other things instead. Uh, the effect uh, uh, was probably that I became, I turned patients into a chronic rehabber, as described by Rod and Tim Gabbett. And you know, we spend a lot of time talking about yellow flags in patients with back pain, but I was a yellow flag. I was creating part of that chronicity. I did it for my own back pain better than anybody else, so at least I suffered a little bit from my own stupidity. Um, and again, there's a time to be cautious. So if you look at the text on the left, you know, that seems reasonable. But what's the logo down here about? Fear everything. <laughs> now, I think there's nothing wrong with the advice on the left. So I'm not in any way trying to give the message that we should tell everybody to just move with abandon and throw yourself at it. But I think deep down in our belly, we sometimes have that approach. And also, there's, look, there's a lot of reasons for that. We, the best interest of the patient, but also we're probably pushed towards defensive medicine sometimes in terms of like the, the fear of litigation and ever, ever missing anything. Now, there's lots of issues in terms of my rehab, but Adam Meekins, who some of you will know um, from Britain, he's talked about the physio rehab trap um, and how a lot of physio rehab can be very complicated but not really dosed adequately and not very practical and can have a lot of nocebic or frightening language. And while, of course, there can be times when we overload patients, especially very acute reactive situations, we, you know, obviously we need to step back sometimes, but the question is for how long? And I would say there's still probably a bigger issue of underloading people. And again, if you think about the loads, if say if we've got that case with back pain, at some point he's going to go back playing football. And I want you to think about the physiological load on his body when he returns to training and when he returns to play, and contrast it with what the load on his body is when he's in rehab or when he's in physio. How stressed is his cardiovascular system, his musculoskeletal system? So after a patient sees me, and I would ask you all to think about this, after a patient has seen me, what will they be saying? Will they be saying, I saw this charming, good-looking Irishman with lots of hair? Um, how is what they heard influenced by me? 
So if I use the exact same words, if I have a script and I use the exact same words with two patients, what other factors might influence what the patient says about me? What could I do differently? My body language, how rushed I am, how much time I am, how stressed and tired, and all those factors can be involved. But probably at least as important is some characteristics of the patient. So I've had patients where I think I've given them very reassuring information, but I didn't necessarily check. So I, I, particularly if you've got somebody who's naturally or by their disposition a little fear, fearful, worried, anxious, maybe inclined to catastrophic thinking, I can give what's, what I think is a very benign piece of advice around just be a little careful with X. And people can often say, well, that's it. I'll never bend again for 20 years because something awful might happen. And particularly when we think about the context in which we give our treatment, I'm thinking here about the clinic, but also thinking if you're in, a, in the field with the SMP or in a club, and if this, the whole context around an injury or a pain is threatening, so poor relationships with, relationships with the medical team, the coaching staff, a lack of trust, um, there's quite a bit of experimental evidence showing a threatening sh social context increases pain-related fear. And while nobody wants that, I think we underestimate the role of that context and the trusting environment. So some common stories people say, they'll say, you know, my back is stuffed, for lack of a better word. It's the fault of X, and that could be the coach, the physio, the personal trainer, or the activity, like they made me do that awful thing, you know, bowling, football, deadlifts, or whatever else. A lot of the time they'll say, I must <coughs> modify that activity, which might be okay as long as there's, you know, if it's something they want to do at some point in the future, they've got to go back to it. So define, modify, for how long, how much, and then they must choose safe exercises. Whereas I would say, all exercise is safe, you just mightn't be able to do it right now. But the effect again can be that long term it leads to avoidance of activities and caution. So in terms of that social context, Mira O'Keefe, um, former PhD student from Limerick who is now in Sydney, um, she did a systematic review looking at the interaction. How do we, what are the factors that influence me and the patient clicking and, and kind of coming to a, a kind of a common um, perspective on what we need to do. And it includes a mix of things. Practical skills, so being a skilled clinician is important. Um, organizational and environmental factors seem to be very important. Having enough time, space, privacy when it's necessary. But the, over, the most important part in all that was communication. Again, which overlaps with time and so on. So if we want people to have a clear understanding of what we want to tell them about activity and for them to tell us exactly what they're doing, time and communication seem to be key. <coughs> So what exercises do I give people? <clears throat> this, um, first of all, this trial sums up what a lot of trials are showing. Comparing three different types of groups, and if, again, as is always, almost always the case, there was no difference. So they found there was three things you'd probably want to consider. Preference, cost, and access. And when it comes to preference, they meant what the patient or athlete prefers. Is that always what happens? In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that if I like doing weights, my patients will do weights. There's nothing wrong with weights, but is it what they want to do and what they need to do? Um, and even if it comes to like looking at um, whether GPs give lifestyle counseling advice, we know that there was a recent paper again showing GPs who do exercise are much more likely to prescribe exercise. So that's good, except it's a shame that the inactive GPs allow that to influence their prescription as well. Cost and access, again, that will vary in terms of um, the location and the site. But for example, if, let's say you've got somebody who you think would benefit from um, a bit less weight bearing. If you've got an Alter G treadmill, great. If they don't, don't tell them what you really need is an Alter G treadmill and then not be in a position to provide it for them. This sounds really basic, but it does happen. And then specifically looking at what we're talking about here, I have to consider preference, cost, access, because again, they drive compliance. If you give a person an exercise they can't afford, it's not available, and they never enjoyed, don't be shocked if they don't do it. However, on top of that then, they might not necessarily love running, but actually if it's a part of their sport you've got, and they really want to go back to sport, that might be part of it as well. Or Nordics, they might not love that exercise. But if it's part of it, that can be built in as well. But in sport and life, you might have to do some of these dangerous things, because you can't avoid them forever. <clears throat> so going back to the case, 19-year-old footballer, he's got sore recently. Um, there's definitely some things that are making him sore, so we mightn't want to necessarily provoke that. He's got some <coughs> stuff on his spine, which is enough to make us think that could be related to his pain. So where do we go? The real challenge here, and this um, fits with Dr. Albert Aziz's talk just a couple of weeks ago, 
we can't say much about co with confidence about this. So the next couple of slides should come with a kind of a caveat that this is opinion based, some of it. And I'll try and clarify where I think we can say we've got some evidence and where we're talking about these are some things to think about. Evidence is lacking in cases like this. We know a few things. Bone marrow edema is common in young male athletes with back pain. And if you have pain-free bone marrow edema, that is, if there's some stuff on your back which is picked up incidentally, it does actually seem to increase your risk of back pain. So Australian cricketer just about to publish a paper showing athletes in pre-season who had some of this bone marrow edema, their risk of developing back pain and bone marrow and, and kind of um, symptoms related to that was increased in, in the season. So it's not necessarily something you can just simply dismiss and ignore. There is also the potential for bone marrow edema to develop into a fracture. So there are a couple of reasons to think, well, this could be relevant. However, it's also common and pain-free. And um, even in cases where the bone marrow edema has kind of evolved into a fracture, lots of times athletes will return to absolutely full, pain-free function, yet that fracture is unhealed. And how you do in terms of pain and function long-term doesn't seem to be in any way related to fracture healing or not. Now that's quite confusing for us. We'd like it if it was much clearer that you know you make sure the bone heals and then their pain and function is better. And that obviously we'd like it if this never happened in pain-free and always was only seen in patients. So I'd like us to discuss this a little bit and then we'll come back to a few other things. But I'd like some suggestions um, on what to do in his situation, what not to do, and for how long. It's easy to say rest, yeah, of course, but how much and for how long and what are we resting? His spine, but we exercise other parts of his body? His legs? What about his cardiovascular system? How do we explain the pain in the imaging? How dangerous is that finding in terms of him bending and being active? What if the imaging findings were different? What if there was a fracture? What if it was more chronic? What if he has a different age or maturation status? Or it being a recurrence? He will want to know things like, is football and running and training safe for him? Is that a simple yes or no answer? What if he can train hard, just not in some tasks for now? And how do we make a decision to try football and running again? That's a lot of questions, but I thought we'd have a bit of a discussion now and we'll come back and we won't, we'll do some more talking at the end. Any suggestions on, because I've got to say, we, we can't say with any confidence that we know what to do in situations like this. The good news is, he's going to do fine in the long term. As Dr. Abelaziz was saying, the last day, long term outcomes here are excellent. It's just a question of how we manage that short term. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and and there will be so absolutely. What does he think is going on? So for example, you'll see some extremes where there'll be the athlete who hasn't clue. They said something in my back, but I'm not a bit worried. I, I want to play tomorrow. And the person where they or their family are extremely worried. And they've been told this is a very serious and rare condition. And if you don't look after this, it will affect your career and your progression. Because if we push him, let's say I I'm, I want to push him into activity, but he thinks it's not safe, dangerous he's unlikely to kind of um, comply or kind of engage with that. Any other thoughts or questions? Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work Rod has done. If it was his hamstring, would we do any of these things? Suggest he avoid sprinting forever. Suggest he be, sorry, be very careful sprinting from now on. So or, uh, and progress the activity based on imaging? And I'd say, there's no way we'd, we would do that, I hope. <laughs> um, in other words, we wouldn't tell them, oh, don't ever sprint again, or if you go sprinting again, be really careful, think about your hamstring all the time when you're sprinting. That'd be pretty hard to do, by the way. Um, and we wouldn't progress the, the return to play and the progression of criteria based on imaging. That doesn't mean you're ignoring the tissues, however. That doesn't mean Rod gets the athletes out sprinting on day one, okay? Um, one of the things I've learned from Rod over the time is the importance of exposure. He's taught me a lot about it in terms of the importance of kind of um, having some criteria and testing where the person is. You know, uh, if we want to think about going back to sprinting, well, rather than saying I'm going to say you're going to do it in four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, well, what are the criteria with which I could test that? So on that point, we wrote a piece with Tim Gabbard on handling situations like this and how you can have almost... On the one sense, you can react with too much fear and avoidance and transmit that fear and avoidance to the patient. Where you blame their sport, blame their vulnerable body, panic and withdraw them from all activities, and then not consider some of the other factors, systemic factors that can be involved, um, that might be relevant. For example, sleep and so on. 
where you not alone end up frightening them, but also withdrawing as an athlete them from training and affecting their fitness and performance and leaving them vulnerable to other injuries because if they've detrained that much, they're more likely to develop other aches and pains. In contrast, we can, without forcing them and without pushing them into a lot of um, discomfort, reassure them that, yes, you're sore, but sport is not that dangerous. You're sore, but that doesn't necessarily mean brittle or too vulnerable. We contain, maintain load as much as possible. Again, that's not saying we provoke their pain, but really try and come up with flexible ways to maintain their load as much as possible and try and consider any other systemic factors that might affect them. So, as I was saying, these are suggestions. These are not rules or kind of things I can say that are set in stone. These are some of the things we would try. We would try and avoid or reduce painful activities. It's that basic. Okay, so everybody will agree with that. Probably what's different is that we would start with very small reductions. So, for example, if the person has said, I trained, I had six sessions of training for an hour and a half last week, which is not uncommon with this age group, um, that's about nine hours of training, and we could break down what exactly they did. For me, saying, right, going from nine hours to no hours of cardiovascular training seems extreme as the default. So having a 90% or 100% reduction in training, that seems, in the absence of resting pain and any ridiculous symptoms or anything to be worried about, a bit too extreme. So can we try and have an estimate as to how big that default, that step back is? Okay. Then as much as possible, as soon as we tell somebody we're dropping this activity, can we add on something else to try and compensate for those other direction, uh, reductions? And ideally they would both be, they would be pain free but also stress their cardiovascular and musculoskeletal system to some extent and if at all possible reflect what they will be doing in their sport later. As I said before, preference, cost and access are priorities. So if the person really said, you know, I've always liked jogging in the pool and they really want to do that to keep up their fitness, fine. They want to do a lot of it, but you know, I can, I can live with it if it means they will commit to doing that. If they said, you know, bike, uh, working on the bike, I like that and I'm happy to do some heat intervals and we can keep it comfortable and pain-free, yeah, that's fine too. Modifying the type and pattern of exercise is still an option. It's just not always the default. So I'm open to the idea that if he's comfortable doing some running, that doesn't mean it's a total no-no either. But we'd be guided more by the pain response, same as you would with a hamstring, than a, an inherent fear of tissue. And then we've got to think about the demands because of whether we're talking about ACLs or the spine, we have to expose people to the tasks they're going to force, uh, to, to face. And this is really important if, got, if they've got a severe case of fear or disability. So for example, if you just practice knee flexion extension and never landing, that ACL is never going to be um, rehabilitated properly. In the same way, if my only spinal exercises are lying on my back doing some pelvic tilting and rolling my knees and doing some pulling my knees to my chest, there's nothing wrong with those exercises, but don't be shocked if somebody then can't go and play tennis and, you know, bend and rotate. And so while we're thinking about these things in terms of activity, and uh, I just have some of these people, so Derek is some guy, Derek Griffin, who's um, been very useful for me in my understanding of exposure and generalization, and then these are some colleagues of mine from Limerick, so Roshan Cahalan, Michelle Biggins, and Richard Johnson, and the three of those and their PhDs are looking at the role of factors such as sleep and mood in terms of developing aches and pains. So for example, Roshin studied dancers and she found amongst all the things like fluctuation and load, which is really a risk, um, sleep was also a very strong risk factor. And Richard Johnson, who submitted his PhD yesterday, he looked at um, endurance athletes and looking at the risk factors involved in developing an injury. And again, fluctuation in um, activity was the pattern. So it wasn't that one of the, he looked at a mix of endurance athletes, triathlon, running, cycling, rowing and so on. The activity wasn't key. It was the fluctuations, the spikes and load that was key, as well as the usual stuff, sleep, mood, and so on. So in other words, um, when we think about the activities, rather than worrying about the one that's safe, the bending, the lifting, the twisting, can we think about how much they're prepared for training? So to finish, some questions. To reassure people, we're not saying we keep provoking people. What we're trying to say here is, can we reduce pain and provocation in important activities? And then if we are going to reduce those activities, does the person really understand we're only talking about short term until you're okay to do it because it's safe and it's part of your sport? A question, because I'm not sure what the answer here is, but we know generally rehab doesn't have to be 100% pain free. Ben Smith did a systematic review showing exercise rehab involving an element of pain is at least as effective as exercise and rehab, which is completely pain free. Now again, I'll always, if possible, go for the pain-free rehab in a case like this, which is pretty early. 
but we probably need to think about whether we allow people some element of pain when they're doing some of these activities. And again, looking at their ability to recover. So are they sore the next day or have they settled? And can we work as a team? Because there's always issues here in terms of making sure that the physio or the coach or the manager aren't blaming each other. And that just doesn't help that social context, which probably doesn't affect, uh, help healing. So number one, respect the tissues. Don't force people, don't re-injure tissues. But equally, allow their understanding of that to, to develop confidence and self-efficacy. Don't scare them long term. And then some other questions. So rather than focusing so much on vulnerability and the dangers of you know, spraining your knee when you land or the dangers of hurting your back in the gym, can we focus on robustness and resilience and building up capacity? Rather than worrying about the specific tasks like, oh my goodness, they're doing back squats. That's the end of the world for their back. Well, have they practiced them and how much load have they done and have they built that up properly and is it part of a, a kind of a, an adequate program? When we think about stepping back activity, how big does it have to be? And does that reflect our fear or what the patient actually needs? Like the easiest option is generally say, don't do anything. Like just rest. You'll probably feel good, at least in the short term. But can we make that, really think about how big that step back in activity <coughs> needs to be? And really put an emphasis on what they can do, not just what they cannot. Because again, that'll have implications. Maybe not so much for their pain in the short term, but their ability to return to play and performance. In this downtime, obviously we can work on some other capacities and skills. And I suppose a challenge for the coaches would be for me to say, can we get some team training before they are 100%? Because it's very hard for me in rehab to push an athlete to 95%. Um, and psychologically, it's much better for them to get back doing something. I appreciate coaches don't want athletes who are eternally uh, rehabbing and training at 50 to 60%. But if there's a, a, um, a pathway with which we can get athletes back in with their team without meaning that um, they have to play then the following Saturday, that can be very useful. And again, that a, lot, a lot of that depends on trust and relationships. And I suppose critically, can we safely return them to all necessary activities? So in terms of high-speed running and hamstrings, as we touched on, it is a risk factor. It is also protective if they do enough of it and build it up over time. Um, so it is both the trigger for injury, but probably also the vaccine. Lifting and twisting and, and, and other activities that load the spine are probably the same. For sure, you can get an acute bout of back pain if you lift or twist or really, you, you can do it using many different activities. But that doesn't mean it's dangerous. And if it was triggered by the activity, it doesn't mean the activity was dangerous. It's probably more to do that you haven't been practicing it a lot, or you were a bit sensitive at the, at the time. You were tired and run down and so on. So when we're thinking about that rehab, avoid big drops in performance to keep them healthy, happy, motivated, so that they don't fear pushing themselves in the future. In conclusion, <clears throat> if we tell people to avoid an activity, don't be shocked or blame them if they do what we ask. Exercise is almost always safe. Uh, when it's not safe, rather than blaming you know, the swimming or the running or whatever that was, it could be, but also just consider the context. Had they been conditioned? Is this an unaccustomed or not? I think it's a very high bar. You want to have a lot of evidence and a lot of confidence to say, you know, uh, Matt, you should never do this exercise again. That's, that's a big claim. As opposed to saying, mm, you're a bit sore. This puts a lot of load on you. Maybe in the short term we don't need to do it. And then if you never actually really need to do a, that particular thing again, fine. But if it's part of living a normal life or part of your sport, they've got to do it. And I guess the key thing I'm talking about here is if we're going to reduce or modify load, does the athlete and probably family and coaches understand why and for how long and what they can do instead? Is it just rest and wait for it to happen? Have I made them feel threatened and vulnerable or reassured that, yes, it's sore, but it's not serious? And do they understand on how we decide on progress and return to play? Do they leave me thinking, well, as soon as the picture looks good, it's all hunky-dory? Or are they understanding, no, it depends on how, I can kind of, how much load I can tolerate? And I guess the critical thing is, have I checked? Because this has been a big learning experience for me. I would speak to people in my best fast Irish accent and then be shocked that when I checked, they didn't understand what I said. And it still happens an awful lot. So really making sure, again, it's hard with time and sometimes here, language difficulties and so on, but really checking what did you take from today and how would you explain it to somebody else. Essentially, if we're ever planning on doing an activity, if I ever plan on going rowing, practicing rowing mightn't be a bad thing to do. If I ever plan running, running mightn't be a bad thing to do. Um, so look at what your athlete or person needs to do, and then rather than scaremongering them about the dangers of standing or walking or whatever it is, try and see if we can, in the medium term, build up their capacity to do that.
and finally, to go back to the societal stuff, consider how this applies to pain-free populations, who admittedly are not your focus now, but we'll all have family members and children and so on. How this applies to health promotion advice, very well-intended advice around the danger of school bags, ergonomic advice that your desk must be at this angle, never this angle, obviously, the world will end at this angle, and uh, manual handling and so on. And how it applies to, you know, the dangers of, warning about the dangers of running in schools, insurance issues, cycling to school, climbing trees and so on. These things, there is an element of risk in them, but to avoid all risk is to not live a fulfilling life, I would say. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people who have contributed to my work. Um, we have a website which some of you will know, which will have some of the information. And if anybody wants, I'm more than happy to um, send on the slides and references. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>